Morning. Good afternoon, everyone. And look, yeah, Graham, thanks very much. And to Beefland Genetics and all the farmers here today, thanks very much for the invite and the opportunity to get up and speak to you today. So, so I just, I just really wanted to touch on, um, firstly, um, what is our Silver and Farm strategy? And it's, it's been a strategy we've been working on for eight years now, and, and it is all about adding value. So. Today I really just want to walk through the story about that. I want to show you some of the work we're doing in the market, but also bring it back to farms, so you know, why the role of the farmer is so important in this. And th this diagram here probably captures that strategy the best, where it it's all about connecting the circle. So starting back on farm, where you know, through the pastures you're, you're planting, um, from the genetics you're selecting to grow your animals out, um, you know, that plays an important role for us when we get right around that chain to a consumer that we've got a product that, that is worth more, more money, it's got more value, and that consumer is prepared to pay more for it, and, and rightly so. So I don't think there's any argument here in, in that for us, uh, and for you as farmers, this, this is about creating more value. It, it is the only answer. And we know that farmers want more profit. We know that there's a, there's a huge amount of value that can come from our consumers. Um, we're all consumers, so, so what are you prepared to pay more for? We also know that the on-farm opportunities are huge. There's a lot of room for improvement, and that includes genetic gain. There's still good opportunities out there for that. And it's all about creating more value, so it's there. So if we bring that back to the meat industry, and uh, you know, I guess we get put up um, on banners for different reasons at different times, but you know, there's a big chunk of what we do is still commodity, and, and this slide sort of captures that quite well. So. You know, down, down the bottom there, the, the bulk of, I guess, what we're producing at the other end is a commodity product, and, and it gets influenced by different things. But the thing we're doing to try and change that is around adding value. So, so the first area we've focused on a lot is around chilled products. So this is where your lamb leaves come into it. And these are a lot of the whole cuts that we can sell into the restaurant trade, you know, um, cafes. It's worth more money. And the new area that we're pushing into more and more is around the value add. So these, these are the retail products. They're the small packs that you're selling for $40, $50 a kilo on the supermarket shelves. And what you're doing is, is creating a, a want there from consumers that'll keep coming back and buying that product 52 weeks of the year. So the important thing to point out here is those top two value add areas though are on value. The bottom area of the commodity is on volume. And the opportunity is to suck a small amount of that volume up into the value add and improve the overall value of that carcass. So that's your strategy. So, it's, it's going well, um, it's growing. Um, we've now got markets in place that go 52 weeks of the year, and as we go to these markets, I just wanna show you a small video now that sort of captures, I guess, um, I mean, this makes me proud to be a New Zealander. It's the essence of what we are as farmers and what we produce, so have a watch and see what you think.
love food, you make it well. And when it's this well made by nature, you take care of it and where it comes from. Sharing only the best with the ones that matter the most. This is what we're made of. So that, that gives you a bit of flavour, I guess, where, you know, how we're taking this product out to the world. And um, I, I know this is a sheep breeders forum, but I'd just like to talk about beef quickly because um, I think there's a good story here to say um, around what we're doing with beef, but also this is the opportunity that exists with lamb as well. So Reserve Beef, um, seven years ago we started looking at how we could create uh, a different market for beef um, through some, some measurement so that we could actually, you know, go from animals that we didn't know how good the eating quality was to saying this is a pass and this is a fail, and let's, you know, the one that's passed is for good reasons. So, so we set about um, testing a whole lot of animals. So we did DNA samples. Um, we kill, um, took nearly 97,000 samples of beef and put it out across nearly 14,000 consumers around the world to determine um, you know, what they liked around good and bad meat. And that formed what became our, our beef EQ grading system, uh, which we're now in our fourth year doing. So. We've put nearly half a million cattle through that system now, and the average hit rate is about 28%. And this is what it's all about. So this, this is our, our latest retail pack. It's now on the, in the supermarket shelves. It's called a flat iron steak. This actually comes from the blade steak. So you're probably looking at a cut of beef that's not worth $5. Um, it's the bottom side of the blade on the underside of the gristle, and in that pack there, it's probably worth about $48 a kilo. So when you go back to that overall increasing the, the, the value of the carcass, these are the small cuts that allow you to do it. And the good thing now with the farmers that are you know, part of that 28% pass rate is, is they're coming back and saying, um, how can I improve? How, how do I get my hit rate up? So this is um, you know, one of our farmers killing a couple of thousand head of beef a year. And they started off that the highest they could get their hit rate back in 2014 was around about 37%. So we've been working with, with them and other farmers on what some of the best practice. Um, genetics comes into this space as well. And now his, his top um, hit rate's up around 87%. Um, and that's banking an extra 40,000 straight onto his bottom line because we pay a premium for, for that meat. And the good thing, and I guess that's been a common theme that I've picked up today through the presentations, is we're starting to see a huge amount of data and, and the opportunity for farms to capture more data. And you know, starting with genetics, there's a lot of information there that can flow through to us and the meat companies. So these are the types of reports that we can generate now around beef EQ. And it goes right down into those traits that we're measuring on each carcass. And we're in the process now of just about to print a booklet which is taking all that science around meat quality. So everything from you know, what, what creates marbling from a genetic point of view, um, you know, why is pH important to a consumer around meat eating quality. We're also matching that with um, best practice on farm. So what are all the things that you can do on farm around genetic selection or, or on farm management um, to get those up so that you can create plans and improve those results. And just, just to give you a bit of a snippet in there, like marbling, it, it is a very important trait around meat eating, eating quality. There's obviously two areas that affect it. Firstly is genetics, so an animal has to be able to express marbling in the first place. The second thing is we've got a lot of cattle out there that um, don't have any marbling, even though just genetically they can, and that's generally because they haven't been fed well. So it's about taking that information there again for our farmers and using it um, to get those hit rates up. And we've got really good information there around breeding values. Um, and the other area is, you know, we can start to look at things like nutrition that will also affect that. So, and, and that's going to come down to even, even timing. So, you know, with steers and that, it is, you know, potentially growing them out heavier and then working out at what weights does your marble start to express. And the book that's going to have all that in there. The other area that's sort of becoming quite interesting in this is, is the on-farm effect as well. So, and, and, and that's what we're finding. It's that last sort of four to six weeks of that animal's life um, you know, by selecting early, um, you know, making sure they're well fed, how you handle them, how you bring them in, how you truck them, they're all things that are affecting the eating quality of that animal. And once again, it's all backed up by the data 
in that report I showed, showed you before. And you know, e even right down to um, you know, where you purchase from as well. So you're starting to see supply chains forming amongst those you know, beef breeders and finishers, which I, I think is a great thing. And once again, they've been rewarded for quality. So lamb, um, yeah, we, we've been focusing on this area for some time and, and it has been a hard enough to crack. Um, through our, our market and consumer research though, we know now that lamb is right up there. Um, in the US, you know, lamb's priced just below lobster on, on the menu. So you know, there's no doubt that we can go out there and extract, extract value for this product. Um, the other thing that's there though is that lamb generally is a pretty good eating product already. So how, how do we start to differentiate the difference? So you know, we invested through Farm IQ, one of our other projects, looking into this. So we have done some work around SNP chips and genetics with Ag Research. Um, and there are some taste markers within that. Um, we've also looked, I guess, at a, a very detailed level through um, companies like Farm IQ, how all those on farm effects will affect lamb. And you know, there's some very good information coming out of that. And then from that, we just want to piece this together so that when we create these retail packs um, and we go out and demand a premium on that product in the market, that it's justified right back through to the farm gate. So we're into a third year of a pilot um, to create some eating quality and, and start a program around this. Um, we've put just over 10,000 lambs through that this season. There's been a range of measures done on those lambs right, right from on farm through to um, consumer, consumer taste panels. And we're, we're due to get those results back before the end of the year. So um, all I can say on, on lamb at the moment is watch this space. So the last area is just around adding value and it's sort of coming back I guess to, to the start again around that market opportunity. So um, yeah, the great thing we've proven through those value add products is that you remove a lot of volatility from the pricing. Um, what we need now is scale. So what you can see here is you know, down the bottom is sort of traditional lamb um, you know, tends to follow the commodity cycle but whereas with the, the retail products we've been able to increase the value of that over time and it stays there. So that value increases nearly you know, three times normal lamb. And, and, and through that market and consumer research, we've now been able to target some, some areas where we know that there's, um, there's good depth of markets. We've got consumers there that are prepared to pay more. Um, you know, we're dealing with more than 60 countries and over 900 customers out there in the world. Um, so what we're, we're doing is investing in staff to actually go and deal with these people, people directly cut out the middlemen. So we've now got 46 staff employed around the world dealing directly with these customers. And you know, it's going right to the depth of, of having point of sale products, even having our own freezers and chillers in supermarkets so that we can control that. So um, just you know, to, to cover those off really quickly, you know, a couple of key markets like New Zealand has been a key market for us. Um, they sit right up there around these retail packs. It's also been a great market to test these products on. Um, because we do tend to be slightly biased towards beef and lamb and, and venison. So we now sell over a million retail packs in New Zealand alone. And we've done that in three years. The latest market is Germany. So, and this has been a bit of a success story. So we've now got three products on um, supermarket shelves in Germany through the largest um, supermarket chain called Etika. So they've got um, just on 8,000 stores across Germany. We've launched this within 600. We're about to go to just over 2,000. Um, venison's obviously our biggest seller. The challenge we've got with venison is we haven't got enough of it. So the thing with these retail products, when you get them into these stores, they have to be there 52 weeks of the year. So we've launched lamb in there as well, and we've just launched this week a, a range of beef products. So um, to date, our sales are, are ahead of what we budgeted. So it, it's been very good. And this is just a bit of a, a quick show of what it's looking like. So it, it's a good product, Germany, because it's frozen. So it means we can process some meat out of season to fill those gaps. So um, it's, it's a really good story. And that was just a postcard that came through from one of our team um, this week. So that's us. So what I wanted to finish with was just another a video quickly of one of our farmers, actually, because... As you get more involved in, and, and build these relationships with these consumers and customers, they do ask a lot about provenance. So where is this product coming from? Who are the people that produce it? And, and, and really, I mean, for us as processors, when you do, guys do a fantastic job on, on the animal, 
it does make our job easy. So this is a, another video that we're showing to these customers and they, they, they just love the fact that, um, that you know, this is New Zealand. My family has been farming for probably 50 years. In this particular area, we've been here for 35 years. We've got uh, 4,500 sheep and 150 cows. Our farm is 1,300 hectares in total size, but we've actually only got 800 hectares of grassland. be my own boss but I also really enjoy the outdoors and working with animals as well. Growing up on a farm it did give me a sense of, of that stockmanship. Everything is in terms of sheep and beef is, is run outside 365 days of the year. I think animals do have a really good life and that's a, that's a combination of being well fed but also um, having good shade and shelter especially in the, in the hotter days, and that is a, a real priority for our stock. Our kids love the farm, yeah. I think having grown up on a farm myself, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to, to bring my kids up in a similar environment. I think it's been able to have that ability to just drive around and stop, turn off the engine and, and get them out and run around the paddock and have all that free space and fresh air. And, just watch them running around on, on land that you that you care for and look after and it's part of your family. Care and respect is so important, not just from a people basis, but also from an animal welfare point of view. If you don't have that as, as one of your main priorities, I just believe you won't produce a top quality product. We're really proud of the product that we produce and we always have in the back of our minds when those animals go out the, out the gate as to where they're gonna end up. So whenever we're doing anything, we're thinking, yes, this, this product is, is a Kiwi-made Kiwi product. It's completely, uh, comes from a free-range farm that's green, is well cared for. My name is Ben Toswell, and I'm really proud to produce product for Silver Fern Farms. So thank you very much for having me here today. Um, we've supplied some meat tonight, so that's just a way to say thanks very much for your support um, and the hard work you put into producing you know, good quality genetics that leads to, to good stock. So thank you very much. <laughs>